Hi, this is Janine Miller, and you are watching Pieces of Victory. Today we have on our show, Allie Wedge. Allie is a survivor of a lockdown residential program called Circle of Hope Girls Ranch, located in Missouri. It is horrifically open today. Allie endured four years of torture in this compound. Four years. She is in the midst of a possible movie with Pole Star Productions. She is an activist amongst the survival community. And she is brave enough to tell her story of what happened behind closed doors in this lockdown facility. Please welcome to the show, Miss Allie Wedge. Allie, thank you so much for joining Pieces of Victory. It's so nice to have you on the show. Hi, nice to be here, too. Do you want to start from the beginning? I understand that you were locked into the Circle of Hope, which is located in Missouri, and you were there for quite some time. How long were you there for? Uh, four years. Four years. Oh, my goodness. One week is too much. One month is too much. And I can't even fathom four years. Do you want to start from the beginning? How did you, how did you end up in this lockdown? Um. I was a troubled teen. Uh, uh, I was into drugs and didn't go to school and got in trouble with the law. So my parents found Circle of Hope um, online. And I'd been to, like, other places before, like, state facilities and stuff, you know, where you go for, like, 30 days. How was that? Uh, um, it was way better than that place. I mean. <laughs> huh? So you had yeah. You could use the phone, you can write letters, you can have visitors. Yeah. You, could, you could watch TV, you know, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted. Actually, Juvenile Hall? Was it Juvenile Hall? No, so, I went to Juvie, thank God, but uh, I did, like, um, like kids with anger issues and mental problems. Okay. Uh, I sent to a couple places out in Las Vegas. So it was a mental health facility, would you say? Yeah. Okay. And that was far better, of course, than Circle yeah. of Hope, unfortunately. Uh, so let's let's get into the beginning of it. You you had a drug problem. You were in trouble with the law. Um, the, your parents tried to do counseling. It sounds like because you were in a mental health facility. Yeah. What happened after that? Um, they put me on a bunch of medications and stuff. And I mean, I haven't been on med medication since I was fourteen, so I don't ah. need to be on. Congratulations. Thanks. Do you think maybe uh, you were self-medicating with the drugs? Yeah, that was definitely a big part of it. Okay. But uh, my parent, I was adopted by my grandparents when I was two, so they were a lot older when I was a teenager, and it was a lot harder for them to handle me. I think that played a big part in it as well. That's terrible. So they really didn't know what what to do it was your grandparents that raised you is that what you said yeah yeah mm -hmm. so of course they came from a different generation and if something wasn't black and white um maybe they were freaking out more than the norm yeah i think they definitely went in a completely different direction with me than they did my dad so oh, wow. either course really worked out but I think I'm a I'm a better person now, so we're good. When you went to the mental health facility, did they incorporate the whole family? Was it a whole family dynamic, or was it just you um, that you were working on? Just me. I mean, my parents would come on the weekends to visit. You know, like they'd come for like an hour visit or something, but I was there mostly by myself. But it was it was, it was only for like 30 days or a couple weeks sometimes. I'm surprised they didn't include your parents in the conversation with therapy? No, therapy I was pretty much by myself, but they would like talk to my parents, you know, and like call them and let them know what was going on. Right. Okay, so when that didn't work, what was, what happened next? Um, well, I was, I was homeless for a while. And I eventually went home. A lot of stuff happened. My dad told me that we were taking a trip to Missouri to go. I don't remember exactly what he said. 
but I think he said we were going to Missouri to go to check out this place for teenage girls, and he said I was only going there for evaluation. Oh, no. So I was like, all right, cool, fun trip to Missouri. <laughs> Let's go. Oh. And we oh, showed up okay. there. How old were you? I just turned 14. I just turned 14 in December. Oh. Uh, and then I have it written down which what year I was sent there because like I mixed up. Uh, I was sent there January of 20, 2006. 2006, and you were only 14 years old. Yeah. Okay, so you get there, and what was this? What was it like? It was actually pretty quiet. There was nothing around. It was just the girls' home in this like big empty field with like horse stables and stuff and a barn and um. Yeah, me and my dad walked, drove, drove in, and we pulled in, and we went to Brian's office at the time. We're sitting in there, and I, we sat down, and my mom, my dad and them started talking, and he looked to me, he goes, do you know why you're here? And I was like, I'm here for an evaluation. And he goes, no, your dad's dropping you off here. Oh. And they told me it was going to be for like six months, which is cool. You know, but. And of course, you probably thought it was like the other facility that you were in. You had no idea that it was going to be abusive, of course, or. Yeah. What it was going to be like. So let me just clarify for the audience. You were raised by grandparents. Then it was dad. Was dad and grandparents living together? No. Um. I have four brothers and sisters. When I was two, we were all adopted out into the family. Um, so me and my dad don't have a relationship. Me and my mom do now. Okay. But I didn't, I didn't meet her until 2012. And my real yeah. father is meet awesome. Meet her until 2012? Yeah. Grandpa my dad tried to help me find her, but my mom didn't want me to. Raised by grandparents. But then you... Yeah visited your dad for one day and then he brought you into this place? Uh, How'd that go? Yeah. Oh, when I say my mom and dad, I mean my grandparents. Oh. It gets confusing. Okay. So I'll just, I'll, dad, you I'll just refer to my biological parents by their name. That'll make it easier. Well, just, I'll just, I'll remember now. Mom, dad are really grandparents. And then when yeah. you saw your mom for the first time, that was actually your biological mom. In 2012, where was dad? Where's dad? Uh, dad's, dad's in Colorado somewhere. No relationship uh, with your. No, um, I used to have one with him for like a couple years. He used to work on oil rigs and stuff out in the ocean, and when he would come into town, he would like hang out with me for a couple weeks on my birthday for a couple years. But then he dropped off the face of the earth again. Oh, that's awful. And how's your relationship now with him? Um, I haven't talked to him in years. Wow. It's been a long time. So your dad, which is, I understand, Grandpa now, he, he brings you in what you thought was an evaluation. I'm just recapping. Yeah. What you thought was an evaluation. Now they're saying six months to, yeah. calm, to calm you down. And then what happens next? Uh, uh, I cry. My dad leaves. Oh. I get taken downstairs to the, at the time it was like a, a clothes room where they had all the clothes and they had me take all my clothes off and they gave me an orange shirt and a jumper to put it on. <clears throat> and then they gave me another shirt and another jumper and they said, that's what I'm going to be wearing while I'm here. Um. And they assigned me to a buddy, um, <clears throat> which I don't know if I'm allowed to say who it was or not, but it was another girl. Hey, buddy. And, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, uh, to a girl. And I understand exactly what you mean by buddy. So let's just, for the audience, did you have okay. to stand three feet behind your buddy at all times? Yeah, three feet in front of her. In if front she of her? Had it had to be, if she put her hand out and she couldn't touch you, she was allowed to call runner and everyone was allowed to tackle you to the ground. Okay, that's actually more disturbing because now you have to constantly look behind you to make sure she's yeah. right. 
she has to be able to constantly be able to touch you and see you. Right. And you may be walking normal and she just can't keep up. And then you're almost better off behind her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's still degrading. Um, yeah. The thing is degrading, but. It's awful. So you would get tackled if you were too far from three feet. Can you explain about the tackling? What was that like? Um, it's happened to me a lot. So, oh. uh, yeah, it just if a girl is too far away or if a girl's trying to run, everyone starts yelling runner and all the girls have to run and tackle her to, to the ground. It's like a big dog pile. That's awful. So if you were just a little bitty thing and all these girls were just on top of you, um, what if you had health issues? They yeah, didn't that wasn't her. a thing there. They didn't believe you. <laughs> right. If you health issues. That's awful. Yeah. That's awful. They're really putting girls' lives in jeopardy, you know, by, yeah. by doing that. It's, it's awful when they do things like that. Um, but that's just the... That's just one part of the equation here. Um, yeah. So you're going through this. You're you're on Buddy. Um, did they give you lice medicated shampoo when you first entered in? Um, no. Some places do that. I wasn't sure. Were there uh, windows in this facility? Yeah. Were they locked? No, nothing was locked. Nothing was locked. Interesting. The only, the only thing that was locked house's office and like if when we left for church they'd lock the doors nothing was locked their right. theory was because they were in the middle of nowhere that you're not going to run and because there's policing going around around the whole yeah uh, compounds with other girls watching other girls and you're going to explain all that in a minute with the hierarchy system so now you're an orange shirt you're in front of your buddy um, what else is going on in this place? Are you hearing screams or? Um, it, it was very quiet. Nobody was allowed to talk. Um, Dorm silence? Yeah. You weren't allowed to talk unless you raised your hands, and even then it had to be important. If it was not important, you got push-ups. Um, you were allowed to raise your hand to ask questions, to go to the bathroom. That was pretty much it. So it was what they deemed was important. I remember um, you would get punished for asking a stupid question. And when I went to a normal school, teachers encouraged you to ask questions because yeah. that's how you learn. So how are you supposed to learn unless you ask a question? Yeah. And to me, this place was just so foreign and so out in left field, and it was beyond that. It was just highly abusive to punish a child for asking a question. Yeah. Um, that's wrong in itself. But, again, that that is nothing compared to the brutality that went on in this place. I understand that, that you had to recycle clothes. Um, yeah. Like we, got, we got two pairs of shirts and two jumpers to go through the whole week. I think laundry was Wednesdays clothes? and Sundays. Huh? Were you in school with dirty clothes? So the, yeah. the clothes you used to go work out in the field, you had to wear yeah. that to school. Yeah, we wear we wear one outfit from Monday to Wednesday, and then Wednesday or Thursday to Sunday, we'd wear another set. Would it smell? Yeah, we'd be out shoveling horse poop. Right. Working all day long, moving one pile of rocks to another pile of rocks, like just useless stuff, all day long in the heat. And did you get a paycheck for all of that? No. No, so slavery. Basically yeah. slaves. Child and labor. Hard labor, child labor. You were do you you all were running the place, so laundry helpers, cooking helpers. Yeah. You cooked your food, you did the laundry, the vacuuming, the cleaning, the scrubbing, pulling weeds, landscaping, hard digging yeah. out in the field. Yes? Okay, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm going through all the things that went on in my school. Yeah. It's a sister program, by the way. It's a Lester Roloff program. And um, are, you, are you familiar with Lester Roloff? Yeah. Okay. 
yeah, you were there for four years. I'm sure it was incorporated. Uh, did you ever listen to some of his sermons on tapes, recordings, and uh, We didn't do that, but I do know who he is. Okay. And you were there at a time where isolation didn't take, the room of isolation wasn't there no, yet. No, that was not there while I was there. Girls would abuse other girls and climb up the hierarchy. Do you want to explain the hierarchy system? It was it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world there. I don't blame any of the girls for anything that ever happened there because they were scared. Exactly. They were scared what they were told. And it's, it's child abuse. It's child yeah. abuse to orchestrate something like, like that. It's awful. And and yeah. so that tell me about the environment. What what was the environment like? Were you did you always feel like you were on edge? Yeah, yeah. Any little thing could set someone off, and you could get in trouble. What 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 they would do is is girls would hire shirts, could give lower shirts push ups, and, and when you're out on work crew, they would write down your tallies of how many push ups you have to do, so you didn't do them right then. Like you do them during showers. So one day I tallied up like 500 push-ups, but for like the dumbest things. Like, I was to say, how long were these push-ups for? You're saying 500. Did they scrutinize those push-ups that if you didn't do it right or if it looked like you were too weak, did they add more on? How did that, yeah. that work? The, well, we had a one-day work crew. We had a work crew one day, and uh, I, my tallies ended, ended up to like 500 push-ups, and I was fairly new. You know, I couldn't do a push-up to save my life. <laughs> you no. know, i never done one in my life. Some people can't even do 10 push-ups, and that's a struggle. Yeah. Now you're just going into this program, you're not used to it, your body's yeah. not trained, you're not trained whatsoever, and now you're doing 500 push-ups? Yeah, so I, during showers, I had to start my push-ups, and I couldn't do them. I kept falling, so uh -huh. they took me up to brother's office, uh -huh. and... He told he was sitting there with his feet up, watching these old western movies, and he was like, "Get down and push up, push up position." So I did, and he said, "Start pushing." And he wasn't even like looking at me; he was just watching TV the whole time. And I kept falling, and he's like, "If you fall one more time, we're gonna restrain you." Oh my god! And I fell, and I don't know how many other girls were in the room, and who all it was. I know my buddy was there. So all they were doing, those girls that were in the room, were watching you? How yeah, there was other house stuff and, like, three other girls, and I kept falling. I fell. I fell again. They all jumped on me at once. They were all my, from my pressure points, and I said once I stopped screaming and I stopped moving, they would let me up. Well, my finger was twitching like this because they were on my arm oh, and it nice. wouldn't stop. And so I don't know how long they held me down there. And I was just screaming in agony and my finger wouldn't stop twitching. So he wouldn't let me up. That's awful. Yeah. I mean, someone yeah. could have a serious medical condition. We've seen it time and time again on what's going on in the media and yeah. authorities restraining and people dying. And here yeah. you are, children. You're just a 13-year-old, I'm sorry, 14-year-old girl in this compound. And how many people are on you? Four or five? Including five, adults. yeah. Including yeah. Adults, inclu her Including step, adults. Her straddled me and put her knee into my back. What? Her house had an arm on my shoulder and was pushing down on my, my points back here and holding my arm down. She asked to keep my legs. Did she put her knee... In your spine? Yeah. In your spine. I'm a massage therapist. You're not supposed to elbow someone in the spine. You're not supposed to put your knee in someone's spine. Period. Period. That's awful. And um, that was the welcome packet to this place. Yeah. For you. That's awful. Can you tell me about the bathrooms? Um, were you dictated to go to the bathroom too? Yeah. yeah. Um, we were allowed to go to the bathroom every two hours. Um, but they, they had the doors open and they had bathrooms. There was four rooms when I was there and there was a bathroom in between each room on each side and there was doors connecting it. So they, you had to keep the doors open when you went to the bathroom and you were only allowed four sheets of toilet paper. What did they think that you were going to do in the bathrooms that you had to have the doors open? 
I don't know. I guess girls have done stuff in the past. I, I'm not exactly sure. So I any know. any girl well, that does something the they're not supposed they to do. Go to the bathroom. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's I mean, I, I was the reason why a lot of things got changed while we were there. <laughs> I am one of those girls. Oh. You know, anything. But I'm simple. They were probably just simple things that a normal teenager would do. And so what are you gonna, going to do? Severely punish someone and abusively punish someone. I mean, that's what they were doing. It's awful. So tell me about the four squares of toilet paper. I don't, yeah. I can't just use four squares. That's disgusting. Yeah. yeah, you always had stuff left over on your hands. I, that's what I was going to say. I want to get into this here because I want to paint a little picture for everybody. As disgusting it is, as it is, I think if you have to go through this, and because this place is still open today and many schools like this, I think yeah. the public should know the dirty details of what is going on here. So let's just paint a picture here. You have feces on your hand because four t pieces of toilet paper is not enough. And that's what's happening to these kids. Four total, so what, two to wipe your rear and two for the... Well, if you, if you had, you could have four sheets and if you needed another four sheets, you could have it. But, you're but, if, when you, but if you stand up and it's just like a small poop, you would get in trouble. Now they're checking your bowel movement? Oh, yeah. They wrote them down. If you didn't have a bowel movement within every three days, you had to drink milk of magnesia. And that shit gives you that diarrhea that, hard. That, that how, I remember someone saying that in another interview. But that's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous to hear it all the time, how they're checking. Yeah. And it's just an invasion of privacy, too. And as a teenage girl, it's very humiliating and degrading. Yeah. But again, this is just one piece of the puzzle okay, here. And of so course, you were able to wash your hands afterwards, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank God. But still, that's disgusting. Um, it's disgusting and it's unsan It's just unsanitary. And plus, yeah. your parents were paying probably top dollars to have you in here. And they yeah. can't afford toilet paper? Give me a break. Yeah, right. <laughs> Look how much they're profiting. And it's a non-profit organization, correct? Yeah. Not uh, even though I know the answer, I'm going over it again just because yeah. I want the audience to know. By the way, let me remind you: this is a nonprofit organization, so they're really profiting off of this place. Okay, yeah. so dictating when you can and cannot go to the bathroom. People go to the bathroom at different times. It's all how you were designated. So, what happens if I really have to go? Do I wet my pants? Um, what? What happened? Um, there have been some girls that had to go really bad and were told no, and they wet themselves, and they got in a lot of trouble for that because it was attention-seeking. Oh, my um, God. And if you're on work crew, um, if, you had to go to the if you had to go to the bathroom within the two-hour mark before the two hours was up, you would be put in push-up position until the two-hour mark was up. Oh, my God. So it was time to go to the bathroom if you asked to go. That's awful. So you couldn't even ask to go to the bathroom if it wasn't yeah. that great. That's awful to do that to a child. It's awful every time I hear it. Have you witnessed anyone vomiting and having to eat their own vomit? Did you have to experience that as well? Oh, that's awful. I'm sorry. I've seen, witnessed other, it happening to other girls. I've, I've witnessed Brother House. This girl threw up in her plate and he picked it up and smacked it into her face. Oh my god! Yeah. That's awful. She, she was new, like she oh. was there a couple days, and that happened. And of course, when you're new, you're nervous. You're nervous. I, mean, I didn't. I didn't go pee for like a week after I got there. Like my bladder, like they had to go to the they had to go to the um the the store and get me stuff to help me pee <gasps> because I couldn't. I seriously like my. I was in so much pain. Because oh. I just couldn't pee in front of people and the stress of being there, I just couldn't do it. And it oh. was horrible. I remember my first pee, it was so long. It was like 11 minutes long. Like, that's how it felt. <laughs> and so, the, I'm sorry, they took you to the doctor for this? No, they went to the store and they got, like, a lot of juice and stuff for me to drink. Um, 
they even gave me milk and magnesia thinking that was going to help help like it was the dumbest thing ever like they went to the store and got a lot of um uh what's that juice that helps you with like a urinary tract infection oh yes um i know what you're talking cranberry juice Cranberry juice, yeah. They made me drink a bunch of cranberry juice and drink milk and magnesia, which I don't know why they did that because I couldn't pee. <laughs> I know. That's crazy. Which brings yeah. me to my next question. Was there any medical staff? On no. No. Okay. And then they refused to take you to the doctor. Yeah, so I, I didn't go to the doctor the entire time I was there. I did go, go to the dentist. Repeat that again. You were there for four years. I just want the audience to know this. You were there for four years. How many times did you go to the doctor? Zero. Zero. How many times did you go to the dentist? Uh, I got my teeth redone, so like four times. Four I took fillings. Oh, my parents paid for it. And my staff took me into town to the dentist. But while I was there, the first appointment, I think I was like a pink shirt. And when we got home, called me up into the office and he demoted me to a black shirt because the, the dentist told me that I told him that I was going to go back to the girl's home and strangle myself with dental floss. What? I never, I never said that. The Miss told brother how the dentist told her that I said that. What? Yeah. It was the weirdest thing ever. I don't think the dentist said that. I think. I don't think he did she, either. I think he's trying to get me in trouble. Evil. That's so evil yeah. to lie, and and they're supposed to be Christian and not lie. You know, not lying is part of being a Christian. That's all. I was called the N word one time. He was screaming in her face, and he called her the N word. She was wow. a mixed girl. That's awful. So she, I she said that I said that if they did, if they took me back there, I was going to strangle myself with dental floss. Oh my! I was God. Kill myself. Oh so I was putting a suicide wash, and I was putting a black shirt. That's ridiculous. Okay, so let's explain to the audience that a black shirt is the lowest of the lowest you can go. Yeah. Yeah. What, how do girls treat you in this place when you're a black shirt, and how does staff treat you in this place? Not good. I was made to pick up dogs with my bare hands. Like, the owners had this chihuahua that would just roam around and everywhere. And I was made, I was I had to go around the house and pick all the dog with my bare hands and throw it away. Wow! And then I told on the girl for doing it, and he was like, "What do you expect? You're a black shirt." <gasps> so he's consenting to I mean, it. He's the problem of the abuse in the first yeah. place. So that doesn't surprise me. Um, let me remind the audience that this place is still open today. I'm going to say this numerous times throughout this interview because it's despicable. Um, what else did you have to do being a black shirt? Um, your work duty. You do the dirtiest jobs, and you're made to work longer than the other girls. Um, like on Sundays, you'd come home and go to work. Before we started staying at the church, if you were a black shirt, when you would come home from work, church on Sundays, you would be made to go out and do the work. Um, same thing on Wednesdays when we come home from church. Or no, because we'd go to church later in the day on Wednesdays. It was Sundays. Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, were you able to go to school as a black shirt, or is that no school when you're the wall? I, I don't remember doing schoolwork pretty much. No, no, much work work a no you're outside working. You're outside working when the other girls are doing school work. You'd wake up at six AM, go out and do chores, come in, read by bi the Bible for like an hour, and then go back out to work while everyone else did school. And then you come back in for lunch around one. And then after lunch, you go back outside and wouldn't come back in till like six or seven. Wow. And how long was school when you weren't a black shirt? Um, not very long. Like two, two hours? Few, uh, like three hours out of the day, and then you go yeah. outside and work. That was pretty much the same with us. It was about three hours. Yeah. School was not a top priority there. Right. Same. Same with us. Okay, won't it matter because you can't transfer the credits. All that work was there.
Exactly. And that's awful. I don't know if you heard the interview with what happened was her parents called in and requested the transcripts and she didn't say anything about school or anything. Just the parents just wanted the transcripts yeah. and they didn't give it to her because it's a big fat zero. They weren't able yeah. to do it. So they tried to pull her out and take her out and she was held hostage. Do you know who I'm talking about? No, I don't remember that happening. Yeah, she was actually held hostage. I'll go ahead and send you that. But okay. And this is the circle of hope. Yeah. They would not give, up, give her up to the parents. And the parents had to call the police department, which means oh, that's wow. documented. The first time I ran away, I, uh, I ran away with this other girl. And uh, we made it to the roundabout in Humansville up into the, onto the freeway. And this car was driving back down with, like, four guys in it. And they asked if we needed help. And we said yes. They took us back to their house. And he called his ex-wife and his daughter to come over and help bring us clothes and stuff. And the girl that I ran away with, her mother lived close. So she came and picked her up. But my parents lived in Vegas, so that wasn't possible. So... I was there for like, like two days, and I went into town and stole a box of chocolate pop tarts um, because you don't get sweets there. And I was like, chocolate pop tarts. <laughs> and uh, I saw the cops pull in, and I ran out the back door and ran through this field, and I was like, I'm not getting anywhere. So I just stopped, and uh, the cop came and handcuffed me and took me back to the police car. And I told him everything that was going on. And he's like, I believe you. He's like, there's just nothing I can do about it. And they took me back to the girl's home. That's awful. I don't understand that. There's nothing I can do about it. You're reporting child abuse. So tell me, do you know how much money your parents were paying every month to keep you in this uh, facility? I think it was $1,100 a month. $1,100 a month. Okay. I think that's what it was. There was other survivors that claimed that he was asking for uniform money and flag money, and there was no flag, no uniforms, and you were shampoo and conditioner. Even though everything was donated, and they like never bought anything, they'd ask for um, like toiletry money and stuff like that. They probably had enough toilet paper too. They probably had plenty and plenty of toilet paper that was donated. It's awful. Fine during the pandemic. <laughs> what? What's that? So they're oh, doing fine during the pandemic. <laughs> I hate to ask you this. You were there for four years. How many times did you vomit, and how many times did they make you eat it? It was one time. I ate a cookie I wasn't supposed to, even though everyone got a cookie. I was on a no talk wristband, even though I was a pink shirt. I wasn't allowed to have sweets, but everyone got a cookie, and nobody said anything. Because the plates are pre-made, and you walk up and you grab one. And so I grabbed one, ate the cookie, no one said anything. Someone went and told the owner. Oh, he no. Called, he called me up into the office. He had the, his wife drive to town, and they bought, like, ten bags, like, the big bags of candy, you know, that you buy for Halloween. Right. He brought him back, and he made, he made me eat one bag and then drink a pitcher of water. Oh, my God. Bag, drink a pitcher of water, and it just went on and on. And eventually, I threw up, and and he's like, now, next time, you won't eat those sweets, will you? Oh, my God. That's awful. Yeah, like, my that's stomach hurt so bad. Unbelievable. Yeah. I lost so much weight just when I got there. Go ahead. I lost so much weight when I got there that they, they started keeping track of girls' weights. They would weigh you once a day and write it down in this log. And if you got below a certain weight, they would put you on triple portions, which is you get your food plus three bowls of cold oatmeal that you would have to eat on top of your meal. And I, I couldn't even stand up. My stomach hurt so bad. That's awful. I'm surprised you didn't profusely vomit after that, too. Yeah, it was horrible. And let's just remind the audience that psychological damage is just as torturous as physical. 
So all this time, so yes, you were forced to eat your vomit one time that you were there in four years. But those four years, in your head, in your head, you were th saying to yourself, please don't make me vomit. Please don't make me vomit. I don't want to vomit. I don't want to vomit. This is going on in your head the whole time, survival mode. And that's awful to do to a child because now you yeah. have that in your head the whole time that you're there. Actually, I vomited another time. It was, we were out on work crew and like nobody else saw it because it happened so fast. We were walking and there's three of us walking and I was like standing a little bit behind them. I was a higher shirt and we were just walking and I just like hurt. Like I didn't even feel it coming. I just like threw up on the ground and like I made sure nobody saw me and I just kept walking. <laughs> Isn't it sad that you have to, you can't even do a human function without getting punished for it. And let's just remind the audience that the person that told on you about the cookie was actually a student from of the yeah. school. Right. So there are eating other girls in this school and you were always on edge. So yeah. it wasn't just the staff that were watching you. It were the girls and they were in the dorms and you couldn't get away. That's why no one would run, would, would be able to run away. I ran away four times. Wow. Yeah. They called me Kuhan Luke while I was there because I ran away the most. You know, the wow. guy from Alcatraz that ran away. <laughs> Yeah. And you knew you were going to be there for four years at that point when you started running. Actually, I was told me my parents signed me over till I was 19. And oh, I was so God. young and I didn't know the laws. I, I thought that was like a real thing. So I really thought I was going to be there until I was 19. I, that's what Brother House said. You, you felt like you had nothing to lose because you were going to yeah. be there for so long. So you just felt like, why, why not run? Yeah. One so time I got tackled. One time I got caught right when I got out the door, but the other three times, I, the last time I actually got away, <laughs> but the other two times I made it into town. Okay, so the other time a cop sent you back. Yeah, that was the first time. Okay, that's the first time. Another time you were tackled. Actually, let's back up. The first time I ran away, um... The lady that I was staying with called CYS when the cops took me back, and they came out and to interview us to figure out what was going on. Okay. And called us all up into the living room, and uh, he made us repeat over and over and over again what we did that day. Like we had a good breakfast, we stayed inside and did school. You know, we had a big lunch, big dinner. You know, like it was different. And he made us repeat over and over and over again what we did that day and how the day went. And he said, if any of you are caught lying, you know what's going to happen. So he was scaring us into submission is what he was doing. That's and awesome. when I got interviewed by the lady. I told her everything that was going on. And she said, with this information, you'll be home in two weeks. But I was dumb enough to tell another girl what she said. The girl told brother the agency the lady came back out with her supervisor okay she called me up into the office and they were sitting there and brother looked at me and he goes tell me what you said she said so i did and she looked at her supervisor and she said i never said that oh and i knew i was screwed right then that was uh, that was after the first time i ran away and i was like i'm i'm stuck here for the rest of my life Oh, that's awful. And so, of course, you wanted to run away after that. Yeah. Because if CPS or, you know, the authorities can't help you, who's going to help yeah. you except yeah. you? That's so sad. And yeah. I, hope, I hope someone's listening. I hope CPS is listening. I hope the authorities are listening so they can do something about it. And it's just awful. Like, have some integrity. And maybe... Yeah. A lot of them do. Maybe their hands are tied behind their back. I'm not sure what's going on, but I think we need to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. And, and there is power in numbers. We need help because this is a problem in this country. And the only way to make a change is to make some noise. And we're going to make noise. So you ran away four times. One time you were tackled. The other time uh, the authorities brought you back. What else happened? 
Um, the third time I ran away, I ran away by myself, and uh, I contacted the people that I stayed with before, because I remembered their phone number, and um, they took me in for a couple of days, and actually went with them to like their cousin's wedding while I stayed with them, and oh. then the, the woman that took us in, her husband actually called the girls home, and the cops came and picked me back up and oh. took me back. Even after you told that family you were being abused in there? Yeah, they divorced, and he wasn't there for most of it, but he was like, "This, she shouldn't be here. She needs, because everyone there knows about the girl's home. You know? Everyone knows about the girl's home. Yeah, everyone knows, like, in town, if you see girls walking around with colored shirts on and skirts and stuff to call the girl's home, because we're probably from there. Oh, like, my God, that's awful. Yeah. So everybody's prepped in the town. Ta in town. That's why the first time I ran away, I stole pants before I left, so I could put them on. This is this is dark, and this is somehow legal in the United States of America, because if it wasn't legal, it wouldn't be open, and it's open. Uh, so it's legal to abuse children in the U.S. Evidently, how okay. many times a day would you say girls would get tackled in this place? Uh. Uh, while I was there, it happened quite a few times, but most of the time it happened in Brother House's office. So there's Brother House's office, and then the dining room was right underneath it. So you always knew when a girl was getting tackled because the floors were like that thin. And you could, you could hear people walking around upstairs. You could hear them yell at anyone or everyone, you know. There was no privacy. When that when that stuff happened, you knew it was happening. But what kind of associations do you have when you hear screaming, and then you hear somebody saying a prayer before a meal, which is usually the staff that were abusing the children. They're yeah. saying a prayer. They're quoting scripture. You're hearing screams. Somebody's playing the piano, and it's a, it's a hymnal. Um, what kind of triggers do you have with? Christianity today. I don't go to church. Uh, Understandable. Uh, yeah, I don't believe in that. I mean, I believe that there is a higher power, but I don't believe that you need to go to church or read the Bible to be able to feel spiritual. Right. And it really is about your spirituality anyway. What yeah. good is being in a pew if you're abusing children? It's really about your spiritual walk. And that he would tell us all the time that, you know, when we leave, we're going to, we're going to go to hell because we're sinners and that it, like, if we weren't ready to leave and we were being bad and we wanted to leave, he'd be like, if you left right now, you'd go to hell because you just go right back to your old ways. You know, like it was drilled into us. We were definitely brainwashed while we were there. I was, I didn't know anything about the world when I got out. I didn't know what Facebook was. I didn't, like, the world was completely different when I got out because we were just shut in there. We weren't allowed to watch TV. We weren't allowed to talk to our parents about anything worldly. What happens if you were to, say, talk about a friend of yours in the outside world or talk about a song that you heard on the radio or talk yeah. about the news? Oh. What would, what what were the consequences for that? They hang the phone up and we get in trouble. They cut the like we wouldn't even be allowed to say bye. Like just hang the phone up without saying anything. If you were oh. to another girl in the school about a song on the radio, movie that you saw maybe three years ago, an yeah, artist get in trouble. Name, the word you'd, pants. Yeah, yeah, you'd get in trouble. You'd be put in push-up position for hours or given a bunch of push-ups, up downs. You know. <laughs> Freedom of speech. Buddhism. Could you talk about Buddhism? No. No, absolutely not. What about the um, evolution theory? No. No. Nope. Only thing you talked about was Baptist. The or only way. Bible, King James. Yeah. King James Version. Not the new King James Version. Because apparently that's different. <laughs> Even though they were both written, it just, I just, it doesn't make any sense it was, to me. It was just another world. It was like the Twilight Zone. Yeah. And 
everybody beat to the same drum. And if you didn't beat to the same drum, you were abused. Yeah. And that's sad because Christianity is supposed about free it's supposed to be about free will. There's no free will in this place. If you wanted to make a decision on your own, you can't make a decision on your own. Because now you're a heathen. Now you're mingling with the uh, the devil. Yeah. And now you're labeled. What what happens if you were um, gay in this compound? What are some of the things that no, they would do? I was gay while I was there. And I was considered bisexual. And we, if we were, I was told everyone that if we were caught, or was if we were caught looking at each other, we were to be tackled to the ground. That's awful because human nature is to just look around you. And I'm not even sexual. I don't even know where they got that from. Like that's what that's just what they told everyone. Oh no. Yeah, and I, I have nothing against that. Right. I'm saying like I don't know where that but started from. Pounds, you're an outcast. If yeah the case and that's why I said oh no I said oh no because I know what the consequences are in these compounds because I was in one of these compounds and it's it's scary if you are and I want to convey to the audience that you can't even be who you are in this place yeah. because if you are you're a target you're already a target already but now it's even worse and it's so sad to segregate someone like that and make someone feel that they're unaccepted to society, to this compound, to God. It's sad. What else would they do? To would they humiliate them or call them names? Um, yeah. uh, he would have what's called a family meeting, and he would have all the girls come upstairs in the living room, and if and he'd like go through all the write ups and stuff, and he'd make you do your push ups in front of the girls. Or he'd scream at you and spit in your face. Oh, my God. Again, this compound is still open today. What was the first time you had an outside visitor in this place, by the way? Um, a year after I was there. What? Yeah. A year? My mom and dad came out. Or no. Yeah, a year after I was there, my mom and dad came out. And they came out for a three-day visit. But it had to be on property. And they were only allowed there certain hours of the day. In juvenile hall, you're at least two visits a week. Yeah, and, and you had to have a staff member with you at all times. Right, which means you can't say they're abusing us in this place. When I was 16, my parents came out for an off-campus visit. I was able to go hang out with them, but I had to be brought back at nighttime. I told my mom what was going on. She took me home. And a month later, my they sent me back. Oh, my God. You're kidding me. Yeah. So you told your parents what is going on in this place. They believed you, right? Because yeah. you, you stay there. Um, did they think about getting you counseling at this point? Because you obviously need counseling. Yeah. I was really messed up. Sure. I went home. I went home and then oh. it was horrible. So <laughs> my Self-medicate? Is that what was happening? Huh? Did you try to self-medicate? Is that what yeah. was happening? So instead of getting you help, you're now you're resorting to self-medicate. <coughs> did they trick you into it? How did they well, do it? I, I got in trouble with the police, so they were like, we're going to send you back. So the day before I had to leave to go to the airport, we stayed the night at my aunt's house. And my aunt was like, I'm cool, you know? So she's like, you want some pills, man? And I was like, yeah. And, and it was it was a sleeping pill. <laughs> oh, no. She was like, it's a Xanax. And it wasn't a Xanax. And uh, it was a like really heavy sleeping pill. So they, they drugged me so that I couldn't run away. My friend was actually supposed to come pick me up in my aunt's house, and I told my aunt that. And I did, they not that. Believe, did they not believe you because you were going back to to those yeah. ways again? Yeah. And which has no bearing on child abuse. You're just trying to yeah. cope, but they didn't see it that way. 
So they probably thought, well, if she's using again, then all of that's probably made up just to get out of the place. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. Because I just can't see a parent sending their child back after you just said that you were being yeah. abused. Tell me about the letters. Were they censored, the letters? Um, going? Yeah. Could you yeah, write I you wanted to? Let's say you wanted to write a friend that was at home. Could you write a friend? No. Oh, the parents. Just the parents, the ones that threw you yeah. into the place. Um, when, I, when I first got there, I, my parents had just bought me a dog, <laughs> which was kind of stupid in hindsight because um, they were sending me away. But I wrote my dog a letter like a week at being there, like my dog Jojo. And I was like, Mom, can you put it in her cage so she can sleep with it? And like called me up to the office and was like, you don't need to be doing that. And he like ripped it up and threw it in the trash. Oh my god! Yeah, that's fourteen, awful. You and it was for like a dog. <laughs> I was like, you, "What is it? You're a monster!" Yeah, we're laughing about it, but you know what? When you really think about it, I was that's fourteen. How this, that's how nuts this place is. When you can't even write yeah. your dog a letter, <laughs> and you're just a fourteen-year-old girl. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. That's so sad. It's just the one um, joy that. You might. Mind games. Yeah. You know, it's all about knocking you down. You were trying to just escape, uh, release, and then talking to your dog, and you couldn't even do that. It's yeah. all. I actually have some letters that I wrote my parents, and like every single letter looks exactly the same. Right. I believe you. Every, like, it all because starts. What you talk how about? You, you can't talk you. about how they're abusing you, you can't talk about, about the anything. family relationships. You can talk about church, God, the Bible, right. what you did that day, if it's okay to say that. Right. <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's if it's approved. And here's the thing. I just want the audience that d doesn't know about what kind of world this is. Uh, you couldn't talk about real issues. So how are you yeah. going to fix a family if you can't say, hey, you know what? This really sucks that I'm in here. Or why did you... Lock me in this place, you know. Yeah. You can't talk about what it's like in this place. You can't talk about maybe your relationship, what it was like before you got locked up. Hey, yeah. I'm mad at you, or, you know, let's work on this together. You couldn't be real. So if you yeah. can't be real and you have to be fake, how are you going to fix anything? And yeah. it's it not just fake. this school. I want the audience to know there's 100,000 schools plus in the United States of America that are just like this one that we're talking about. When I was sent back, Brother House wouldn't let my mom come and visit me anymore. It was only, My dad was the only one that was allowed to come and visit me. Why would, wasn't your mom allowed to? Because she's the one that convinced my dad to take me home. Oh. Yeah, so and for the rest of the time. Of the day, for him. So, of course, he's going to be mad. He wants yeah. your, he wants that paycheck coming in. Yeah, that's terrible, terrible. So I'm wondering if your mom still wanted you there, and it was just solely your father at that point because you took you mom and my dad at that time. But I don't want to risk it because oh. me being it's taken out again, praying in that direction at one point. Yeah, that's really sad to keep families apart from each other like that. I mean, that's the whole point of these programs. They're yeah. supposed to be to help families and they're tearing families apart. You're lucky. You're lucky that your family, you know, and these are choices that you made too. You looked past that. You have a relationship with them now. And well, first got out of the girl's home. I was, a, I got back on drugs and I was homeless for three years. Oh, wow. And then I got pregnant with my son, and everything changed for me, and I straightened up. Oh. Yeah. So that was the best thing that happened to you? Yeah. As soon as I heard his heartbeat on the monitor, I quit doing everything. Oh. I, I, I went home, yeah. That's an awesome story. Did you ever get therapy? Huh? Did you ever get therapy after the trauma at Circle Phone? No. no. But you were able to talk to mom? Were you able to talk to mom? Yeah. yeah. Um, when I got home, none of my stuff was at the house. <laughs> like, my parents got rid of all of my stuff. 
So that was hard coming home to an empty room and like this, like it was, it was like I came home and like, to be a guest, like they put me up in the guest room and I had nothing there. And it was very right. awkward at first because I'd been away from them for so long. Right. And I didn't know how to talk to them, you know? So I just resorted to going out and doing dumb stuff because I didn't know how to deal. Oh, and that was when you got back from the circle of hope. Let's just, and yeah. then that's when you that's became homeless. Huh? Yeah. The last time I ran away was when I actually finally escaped and got home. And then you were homeless for three years. Yeah. You were homeless for three years. Then you had a baby, your, your son. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you moved back in with your parents. Yeah. Or did you go, you did. Okay. That's awesome. And then from there, you rebuilt everything. Yeah. It was all uphill from there. Oh, that's awesome. Yep. And so you were able at that point to confide in with your mom. And that was yeah. your and way. My mom of got really close after all, after I got pregnant. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I'm happy for you. Good. And see, most of these places tear down family. So, it's a rarity when something like that happens, and I'm so happy for you. That's fantastic. And I'm just if, reminding the audience of that because if you're contemplating sending your child to one of these places, that could be a good possibility that it will ruin your relationship yeah. with your child. And I just want to get that message across. Is there anything that you would like to tell the audience of, of any kind of red flags, what to look for in any of these places, if they're contemplating sending their child to a conversion therapy, boot camp for kids, wilderness program, a rehabilitation program, what would be the alternatives that you would suggest? Send them to a state-run program. What program? State-funded? A state-funded place. I mean, I mean, any place you go to as a teenager like that is going to suck, but all the state funded places that I went to were a hell of a lot better than that place. And they're being watched, you know, there's yeah, you get more help. You get counseling, you get to deal with your stuff, whether you want to be there or not. But at the girls home, you're just, you're, you're stuck there and you have no way out and they don't help you at all. And you you're don't. somebody's property. Yeah. Pretty much their property. Yeah, at least a state-funded place, your parents can come and get you, <laughs> and you and can leave, you know. You have visits, and, yeah. and normalcy, and letters, and basic human yeah. rights. So that's, that's perfect. Yes. So I feel that one of your coping mechanisms is your children. Um, yeah. You're giving everything that you wanted for yourself to your children. Maybe what was taken away from you, you give wholeheartedly to your children. Do you want to talk yeah. about coping mechanisms? Yeah, they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't be here without my kids. Oh, that, that happened. I don't even know how to explain. I'm gonna start crying. <laughs> it's almost like they're your angels that saved you. I feel. Yeah, they're really your angels. Oh, sorry. No, it's all right. <laughs> you cry. Um, That's cool. <laughs> they are they are your angels, and I'm so happy you're at a good place. I'm so thankful that you were able to to quit using drugs, and and I understand you were only self medicating, but they fill that void. They fill that yeah. void for you. That's yeah, awesome. my life is. I never thought I'd be here. I have a wonderful husband. I got four annoying, beautiful little children. <laughs> oh, but they're your angels, and they saved yeah. you. And that's that's so awesome. Good. How long have you been with your husband? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, be four years in November. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I appreciate you and being brave to tell your story. Thank you, Allie, for being on the show, Pieces of Victory, and being brave enough to tell your story of what happens behind closed doors at the Circle of Hope Girls Ranch located in Missouri. 
If you have a 1% chance that this could happen to your child, why would you even take that risk? My name is Janine Miller, and this is Pieces of Victory.